just because you're dyslexic has an IEP doesn't mean they're ever going to learn how to read properly. I know that may be completely shocking to you, but having spent three decades exclusively working with neurodivergent kids, special needs kids, and kids with emotional and mental health issues, I have sadly seen many kids walk around with an IEP without ever learning how to read or, you know, get the help they need. But when, here's the great news. When it comes to dyslexia, we know exactly how to remediate it. And holy cow, it works 95 to 97% of the time. It's structured, multi-sensory phonics instruction. And the Mac Daddy, the 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 gold standard, I always call it like the the founder, the grandmother, whatever you want to call it. It all stems from a program called Orton Gillingham. And OG, as we call it, um, is really the mother of all the programs. Wilson, Linda Mood Bell, Seeing Stars, Barton, a whole bunch of other ones. They all are based on this Orton Gillingham methodology, ridiculously effective when you do it properly an experienced person and with what we call fidelity. So it has to have the amount of time that's prescriptive to remediate with a certain level of intensity. So the research says that OG-based instruction is needs to occur at least four times a week. Um, and there's, there's some debatability, but somewhere between, you know, 45 to minutes to 90 minutes, but let's just say on average, it's 45 minutes to an hour, at least four times a week for mediates the problem. And as the mother of a triple deficit dyslexic, I know this works. <laughs> um, and, you know, our own story with JC is, you know, I knew he was a dyslexic at two and a half and he only had OG based instruction. So he's had OG, he's had Wilson and Linda Mood Bell uh, visualizing and verbalizing combinations at different points needing different things. Fully remediated, except if you heard in the previous episode, terrible speller. That's okay. We, he's, you know, voice dictation. We got it, right? He loves learning. That's the most important thing. And he just feels so good about himself as a learner, which is incredible. Um, so let's talk about dyslexia treatment. And my experience, three decades supporting dyslexics, formerly specialist, really in uh, neuropsych testing for dyslexic and, and com common cases. And really, we're talking about dyslexia treatment, right? So Number one, let's talk about supporting dyslexics at home. So we have the school portion of this, but at home, we need to do a lot. We need to read with our dyslexics. We need to really give them what they need so they can be, you know, feel more confident, right? We want to have open conversations. I've had parents who wouldn't tell their kid they were dyslexic. And I was like, I think they know how to read. <laughs> this is when I started screening people and you had to apply to work with me. Cause I was like, I'm not for everybody. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like, it's just silly. You know, I had this lady one time before, you know, like over 20 years ago. Yeah. It was, it was pre max. So it was over 20 years ago. She took my report. I'd sent her a PDF. So this was before you could download it and change it. And she rewrote my report. And I was like, I'm not going to, go to a meeting with you and you literally illegally wrote my report and didn't want that, didn't want that her kid was, she wanted me to say her kid was slow to warm instead of having social problems. And I was like, I'm not the right person for you. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's a lot of awesome things. And we are in a neurodivergent world. Like it's almost abnormal to not be neurodivergent, right? Um, so when we are talking about remediation and working with a school, right? We, we have to talk about an IEP, an individualized education plan, which is special education falling under the IDAA law. Look in our notes. I have 504 versus um, an IEP. And, and dyslexics are disabled, and that's okay, right? Neurodivergence 
and they are entitled to remediation. And as I said, we know the prescription. So we talked about identifying, you know, dyslexics. We talked about the importance of testing, not just for diagnosis, but for really clarity on what is missing. So a lot of times back in the day, schools would be forced to hire me. Only one district ever willingly hired me. Um, right? Because I'm an advocate for kids. And I would do the testing and I would really go through, sounds like it's a groundbreaking thing, but it is groundbreaking when you're, you know, you're dealing with uh, the most complex learning task that it is. And so people just because they're educators don't really understand dyslexia. When I was in my doctoral program, one class, the psychology of reading was so hard. 50% of the doctoral students used to drop out of this one class. It was taught by Dr. Lorna Murphy. Her dissertation was 1,200 pages and had to be reduced to 900 pages. Mine was 110 pages. Passed on first one. So she just was so brilliant. She had so much to say. She was awesome. And so it's such a neurolo neurologically complex task. It's more than phonics and language. It's your eye movements. And there's just so many components to it that it's hard for people to understand what it is. And it's just missed. They don't, they don't get it, right? Um, you have a phonics problem. You got a history of family dyslexia. Even if you know it or not, you get to have a dyslexic. I mean, it just is. And there's levels of dyslexic based on people's compensatory skills and the three foundational components, rapid auditized naming, phonological memory, phonological awareness. So I say JC was a triple dyslexic because he had very severe de deficits in all three. We overcome it with proper intense instruction, right? So identifying what each error, what are all the sound letter combinations? A great test for this is a WADE, W-A-D-E. Um, and it's part of the, the Wilson reading program. And basically it just goes through all the combinations uh, of sounds, right? And you should check those. I mean, I would sit in meetings and be like, he doesn't have all his vowels. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's okay. And I'm like, he's 12. And they're like, oh no. I'm like, guess what? There's a vowel in every word. <laughs> every time I would be like, wow, you know, um, I don't miss those meetings, but man, did I torture people in meetings. I'm just saying. I came in real nice. I, I tried. I tried. But then once I knew that they weren't going to help this kid, come on. I, I would get these kids great programs every time. So, um, you know, because you had to. And luckily we had, sometimes we had amazing people on the team who really just didn't understand it and needed somebody to tell them, I'm saying that was a minority of time. But I also did have some pleasant people. Um, and, you know, I get to meet people all the time. I was in the post office um, a few months ago and this mom came up to me and she was like, do you remember who I am? And I was like, yes. And she was like, her daughter was in college and this happened to me the other day too. And, but in this case, she was a really severe dyslexic and she was like, you changed my kid's life because you identified her and got her proper help and we were able to get her help. And I was like, I love that, you know? So, but I was partnering with the parent. So parents have to do it and this is hard stuff, but the laws are in your favor and getting identification. So really going through so that you can get the right instruction. And the intensity of the reading instruction is critical. You can't just get this once or twice a week. Your brain is not going to get it. It's the same thing with working out. It's the same thing with neurofeedback. It needs a lot of repetition in order to overcome it, right? And the multisensory is what we know is the unlocker and it must be structured. So it can't be some made up program. You really need to follow a program. So the Wilson program is really a packaged version of Orton Gillingham, which the, the materials have to be created. Anybody who's OG certified, it's really like a, a full on master's degree in and of itself. These are highly qualified people. 
I love Wilson. I love Linda Mood Belt. These are all super effective research-based programs. You just need somebody who's doing it properly. And one of the greatest mistakes with Wilson, because it is pre-packaged, teachers often go to one training, is they actually don't follow the program. And this is how I'd win every single one of my cases. Little tip is you would say, where did you start? And they would start at the wrong place. So you must start at like ground zero. So this is not like regular classroom where you get to move on and you're only at 80%. You must have full mastery to move on to the next step. So number one, they would start too high for a kid and they would just say, okay, forget it. Like that kid who was missing some of their vowels. And in fact, that is exactly what happened in this kid. Um, that's a big problem. Then they wouldn't do it with the intensity. You really should have it four days a week. I mean, you really should. That is what the research says. The other problem is once kids get older, they start having a lot of social and emotional problems. I never forget. I had this kid and he was so smart. And, you know, he said to me, Dr. Rowe, I am the smartest one of all my kids, but I'm the lowest in my classes. And he was like, it's brutal. And I didn't, I didn't identify him until middle school. And by the time we got remediation, it's never too late to get remediation, but then you're going to have emotional problems. I've had kids be suicidal and I've had kids, you know, with depression and anxiety because they're so smart, these dyslexics, and they know they're behind. So that's how critical early identification, proper reading instruction really is. There are lots of technology tools that schools will want to do for accommodations. They're great, right? But they are supports. They should never take the place. So yes, John Carlo has, um, you know, uh, he's using voice to text. We have tried super hard to remediate his spelling. We are not giving up, um, but it is like, I don't even know what to say. You know, it's just so hard. And, and you know, there were, I'm not going to lie, like bulk of his years, he was getting five to seven times a week of reading instruction because I know what I'm doing and we did it ourselves. So um, he still sees his, um, his, his OG Wilson, Linda Mood Bell tutor all the time. And we do kind of stuff in the summer and we just do keep advancing skills. I have that ability to do that. Not everybody has that ability to do that. But guess what? You're entitled to what? Free and appropriate education, FAPE. So you, your child is entitled to this. It may be a boxing match, but make sure you understand your rights. Follow rights law with a W. Get that book from emotions to advocacy. Every book, every um, letter you need, every legal maneuver, you really want to make sure that is critical. You want to make sure your kids, you're talking open and honestly. You're telling them, you know, you're you're smart and we just need the right instruction. We want to make sure you're giving them emotional support. Um, and hopefully they have a network of people that care about them. But it's hard because you get put in the lower track classes and you're bright and you know it and you're being held back because people are talking a foreign language. You just don't have the keys to it. Um, Long-term success, right? Strategies, right? Proper reading instruction, really supporting executive functioning. A lot of kids with dyslexia are inaccurately diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, almost every dyslexic winds up getting an ADHD diagnosis. I would say less than 50% of them when they come to me and I'm doing a brain map, much less than 50%. I would probably say uh, 25% of them actually have it. What happens is when dyslexics are, are not given proper instruction, they're always using too much of their memory system. We do not have an unlimited capacity for memory. You know, um, it's plus or five pieces of information, plus or minus two. So you can group things together. So they go into overload and then they don't, they can't pay attention. We all know what that's like when you're in overload and you're like, can't even remember how to spell your name. Well, dyslexics, they're constantly using up their memory decoding. Hope that's an aha moment. So you should be able to look at the word, I don't know, cat. 
and know what it is. But dyslexics still, some of them might be decoding letter by letter. Sometimes they're decoding by chunks. So all that brain power they should be using for higher level work, they're still decoding. And so their attention and memory systems fall down. So making sure they're getting those right supports are critical and the, and, and it helps them to feel good about themselves. Really Im important with any of our neurodivergence to help them love themselves. I know that sounds corny, but it is critical. And we move away from emotional things we really only focus on learning. And I know we're saying we need to focus on learning because reading is the key to learning. And if we can't read, we're not going to be able to access those things that make a difference in terms of whatever people want to be, right? Um, and so when I think about all my success stories, if you haven't listened to the episode with Kat, she's my intern for the second time. She's going to come back on again on the show. Um, but I had helped to identify her in when she was 10, her parents did all of these things. We did testing, we got proper reading instruction. And you know, she's finishing up college. She's going to go to graduate school to become a therapist. I'm so proud of her. And, and she's a fierce advocate for dyslexics. And, you know, it wasn't an easier, easy linear path. They had to do a lot of fighting um, and she really, because her parents were so great at really talking to her, she was such a vocal advocate for herself. So when they tried to remove services and she was in high school, she was like, I don't think so. Just because I'm doing good doesn't mean I don't need these services. And she really became empowered. And that was because of a lot of just very open, open, open conversation. Um, and of course she was getting the right help. Um, so I hope this inspires you. I hope this helps you. Dyslexia is reading, uh, reading support is 80% of kids in special education have a goal on reading on their IEP. Not all of them are dyslexics, but dyslexia is incredibly common. It's still missed. It's still improperly remediated. And I hope this conversation gave you a path. And one of my other huge tips is find an educational advocate that can help you on what feels like an arduous road because it is unnecessarily. Um, and I feel like it's a great investment. And there are, you can call your state learning disability associations. Pretty much every state has some free advocates. You usually have to wait a really long time. But Empower yourself with tools like right, Rights Laws, our, our website. And if you're looking for more support, you can always join our free Facebook group. Just go to drrosanne.com forward slash group. And for all my dyslexic mama and papas, you got this.